Hello everyone, today's poetry video tutorial for the AQA Power and Conflict Poetry is for one of my favourite poems from the anthology, which is Exposure by Wilfred Owen. Let's get started and see what it's about. Today you're going to be creating some very detailed notes and making sure you've got some really in-depth analysis on your poem so you've got a good level of understanding. To do this, you will need a pen to make notes, a set of highlighters, and of course, your copy of the poem. If you want to produce your notes and analysis electronically, this is fine too. Just make sure you are saving it properly because these notes will be really important. Through the video tutorials for the earlier poems, You've been shown how important it is to analyse the title of a poem, and exposure is no different. What I would like you to do is to write down the title and consider what are the different possible meanings of the word exposure. So now I'm going to ask you to pause the video for a couple of minutes and mind map connotations of the word exposure. Right, so hopefully by now you've got some ideas of your own. Let's now look at what the dictionary says. Exposure is the state of having no protection from something harmful or the revelation of something secret. Once again, bearing this in mind, I'd like you to pause the video and consider what sorts of things can you be exposed to? Okay, so again, hopefully you've got down some of your ideas. Here are some of the things that you may have written down. Obviously, in modern society, when we consider the word exposure, we think about some sort of secret or lie being revealed. In short, if something is exposed, the truth is being told. If we look at the dictionary definition again, Exposure can mean lacking protection, which can refer to many things such as terrible world events such as war, bad weather and natural disasters, disease or danger of any type. I would like you to keep all of this in mind for your first read through of the poem. Consider how the word exposure is relevant to what Owen is discussing in the poem. Exposure by Wilfred Owen Our brains ache in the merciless iced east winds that nive us. Wearied we keep awake because the night is silent. Low drooping flares confuse our memory of the salient. Worried by silence, sentries whisper, curious, nervous, but nothing happens. Watching, we hear the mad gusts tugging on the wire, like twitching agonies of men among its brambles. Northward, incessantly, the flickering gunnery rumbles, far off, like a dull rumour of some other war. What are we doing here? The poignant misery of dawn begins to grow. We only know war lasts, rain soaks, and clouds sag stormy. Dawn massing in the east her melancholy army attacks once more in ranks on shivering ranks of grey, but nothing happens. Sudden successive flights of bullets streak the silence, less deadly than the air that shudders black with snow. With sidelong flowing flakes that flock, pause and renew. We watch them wandering up and down the wind's nonchalance, but nothing happens. Pale flakes with fingering stealth come feeling for our faces. We cringe in holes back on forgotten dreams and stare, snow dazed, deep into grassier ditches, so we drowse, sun dozed, littered with blossoms trickling where the blackbird fusses. Is it that we are dying? Slowly our ghosts drag home, glimpsing the sunk fires, 
Glosed with crusted dark red jewels, crickets jingle there. For hours the innocent mice rejoice, the house is theirs, shutters and doors all closed. On us the doors are closed, we turn back to our dying. Since we believe not otherwise can kind fires burn, now ever sun's smile true on child or field or fruit. For God's invincible spring our love is made afraid, therefore, not loath, we lie out here. Therefore we're born, for love of God seems dying. Tonight this frost will fasten on this mud and us, shriveling many hands and puckering foreheads crisp. The burying party, picks and shovels in shaking grasp, pours over half-known faces, all their eyes are ice, but nothing happens. So before we start to analyse or think more deeply about the poem, let's talk about some useful context. Exposure doesn't explore the enemy soldiers as predatory, but rather the weather. World War I began in 1914, and at first it was predicted that it would end swiftly, but this wasn't the case. By the winter of 1917, both sides had sustained massive losses and extreme cold weather made the misery even worse. The soldiers suffered from hypothermia and frostbite and many developed trench foot, a crippling disease caused by feet being wet and cold and confined in boots for days on end. Imagine being on the front line at war, wanting to fight for your country, but being unable to do so because of severe and cruel weather. It would make you bitter. You may now be starting to get a picture of how Owen was feeling when writing the poem. Wilfred Owen, the poet of exposure, was serving on the front line of World War I when he was writing, and he was very angry about the depictions of heroism being shown in war propaganda in Britain. Owen and his fellow soldiers were forced to lie outside in freezing conditions for two days. It was against this backdrop that Owen wrote Exposure. Exposure specifically focuses on the misery felt by the soldiers waiting overnight in the trenches, showing that it was desperation that faced soldiers on the front line, not glory. Okay, so what I'd like you to do now is to pause the video for about 10 to 15 minutes and answer as many of these questions as you can. To do this, reread the poem for deeper meaning, keeping these questions in mind. If you get stuck, there are loads of really useful resources online for all of the power and conflict poems, so please do research anything you are confused or unsure about. Keep in mind, as with any piece of literature, the emotional response of the reader is very important. As I've already told you, Owen was writing from the front line to show the horrific realities of war to those at home, to challenge the glorious and heroic images of war portrayed in British war propaganda. Exposure specifically seeks to highlight the futility of war. There is no comfort, no satisfaction, no heroism. This reflects Owen's true experience on the front line and seeks to make the reader more deeply question the logic and morality of conflict, creating a feeling of resentment towards those making decisions in war. Now that you've answered as many of the questions as you could, you can check your understanding against this summary of the poem. Do bear in mind that your understanding will develop as we annotate, so this summary is not exhaustive. Wilfred Owen is our poet and speaker, and this poem discusses his first-hand experience of the front line, but with very little discussion of actual fighting. Nature seems to be their main enemy because the trenches are freezing cold, muddy, windy and snowing. The poem exposes the trauma and monotony of warfare and ultimately shows it to be meaningless as nothing happens. As such, the soldiers return to thinking about their deaths in icy, bleak 
trenches. All right. So you started to think a little more deeply about the poem by answering the steps to success questions and should have a good understanding of what the poem is about and trying to say. So we're going to start annotating now, looking at specific words and phrases that are important to our overall impression of the poem. So make sure you've got your highlighters at the ready and make sure you're adding to your own annotations as I talk you through the poem. You need to be listening carefully so that you don't get lost or confused. I'm only going to touch on our first line very briefly here, as this is one of our key quotations that we'll be looking at in much more detail later on in the video. The opening to the poem is very abrupt, as if the poem is explaining what is happening in the middle of an experience. Our brains ache. This experience is a shared one, which we can tell through the word our. It's also painful, which we can tell through the word ache. This idea of shared experience very much reflects the camaraderie the soldiers had in World War I. Later on in the first line, we find out that it is not the enemy that are attacking these soldiers, but rather nature that is personified and kniving them. Later on in stanza one, specifically through lines two and three, both of these lines end with an ellipsis, which in literature are generally used to create tension. Here, it suggests that the soldiers are waiting for something to happen, but we will come to find out that it never does. You will notice on the screen that there are a series of underlined words in stanza one. Wearied, confused, worried, curious, nervous. All of these words show different emotions, which may reflect the confusion of the soldiers, or could also be another explanation for why their brains hurt. It would be overwhelming to be thinking and feeling all these things at once. Our final line of stanza one will go on to become a refrain throughout the poem. It is a short, simple half line that emphasises tension through its bluntness. The word but at the start of the line suggests that Owen hopes for change, that this war means something, but the change he is looking for never comes. In stanza two, we get more imagery associated with pain that has been caused by nature. The brambles of the barbed wire remind us of the pain that can be caused by nature. In line nine of the poem, we get vivid oral description. All the soldiers can hear around them is the sound of guns in the distance, which is emphasised by the adverb incessantly giving the impression that for these men, the war seems never-ending. The imagery here is emphasised by the onomatopoeia of rumbles. When Owen discusses the dull rumour of some other war, it could reflect how the soldiers are so weary and jaded by both the weather and war that they feel completely detached from it, hence the dull rumour. This is also a biblical reference from the Gospel of Matthew, which states, you will hear of wars and rumours of wars. This may reflect Owen's previous religious beliefs. We know he, like many others, questioned his faith as a result of the suffering he experienced. We end the second stanza with a rhetorical question that directly questions why the soldiers are there, and in turn, what is the point of anyone going to war? In line 13 of the poem, nature is again personified. This time it is dawn that is personified using the language of battle. This is sig significant as when we think of dawn, we think of the beginning of a day. It's usually associated with hope, but Owen subverts that here implying that nature will not save them. 
This also suggests that nature's attacks are skillful and organised, and that the soldiers are unprepared and unable to defend themselves. In line 14, we are told that nature attacks once more, portraying the weather as relentless. By describing the ranks on shivering ranks, it mirrors the soldiers in the trenches. By using the colour grey, Owen emphasises how the battlefield is lifeless and cold. Incidentally, grey was also the colour that the German army wore, so here Owen is aligning both of his enemies with each other, so both the harsh weather and the Germans. In line 16, the first line of stanza 4, we have sibilance through sudden successive flights of bullets streak the silence. This mimics the whistling sound of bullets flying through a cold and silent night. Line 17 presents us with a particularly strange image of the air being black with snow. This is odd because snow is normally white and as such associated with purity. Here, however, it is black, which often symbolises evil or death. This shows how the snow and the cold have become the true enemy. This could also be referring to how snow and extreme cold can cause frostbite, in which your skin and tissue become damaged and eventually turn black. In line 18, we get alliteration through flowing flakes that flock. The alliteration here could represent how relentless the snow is, it won't stop falling. Additionally, the repeated F sounds could also reflect the softness of the snow. It's a very soft sound, especially if we compare it to the sibilance in line 16. However, here, it becomes dangerous and treacherous as it can cause death from hypothermia. We start stanza 5 with a further instance of nature being personified. Here it is the snowflakes that are malici maliciously seeking the men's faces. Throughout the poem, we have many instances of half rhyme but it's particularly effective in lines 22 and 23, where the half rhyme of snow dazed and sun dozed creates a link between the soldier's current situation and their forgotten dreams of the past. This makes the reader feel a lot of sorrow for the young men who were sold dreams of glory and heroism, but will likely die because of exposure to the weather. The half line at the end of this stanza poses yet another question, possibly answering the question posed at the end of stanza two. The answer seems to be that they are here to die. In the first line of stanza six, we have assonance of long O sounds, which you can see on the screen picked out in orange, which slows the speed at which the reader reads the line which may reflect the journey of these young men. Because their journey, either in war or towards death, was slow and painful. In line 27, we have fire being described as crusted dark red jewels, which suggests that the fires are beautiful, but, like jewels, offer no warmth or comfort. The colour dark red could represent dried blood, which may symbolise the death and misery of soldiers who have lost their hope and idealism because of their terrible experiences. The repetition of closed in the penultimate line of this stanza could also reflect the closing of life. As the soldiers watch their comrades die around them, they no longer expect to survive this war. They will either be killed by the enemy or by nature. 
All of this could also reflect the British public losing interest in the fate of the individual soldiers. Additionally, throughout stanza 6, we have caesura on each line, creating a division, which reflects how the men have become separated from their lives and homes. Once again, this may reflect how they have been irrevocably changed by the horrific reality of war. The first two lines of stanza 7 suggest to the reader that the soldiers believe they are sacrificing themselves to the Germans and to nature in order for life at home to be preserved. The language used here is contrasting to the rest of the poem, particularly with reference to kind fires, sun smile, child, field or fruit, all of which have connotations of warmth, growth and happiness. We could read the final line of stanza seven in several different ways. Where Owen says, love of God seems dying. This could suggest that their love of God or their faith generally is disappearing. Or they feel God's love for them is dying, which is why nature is able to attack them so viciously. This could also reflect Owen's previous religious beliefs. As I said earlier in the video, he, like many others, questioned his faith as a result of the suffering he experienced. Okay, final stanza now. So line 37, which I've picked out in pink, creates a vivid image of what exposure to the cold does to their bodies. This is specifically done through the words shriveling and puckering which could reflect what the soldiers have been reduced to. These words have connotations of discomfort, reflecting the unbearable conditions that the soldiers are in. We then get an even more vivid piece of imagery in the penultimate line of the poem, all their eyes are ice. This metaphor refers to both the eyes of the living and the dead men. This is a vivid description of how they've been overpowered by nature. It hints that the living men are no longer able to feel any emotion. Our final line is the familiar refrain, but nothing happens. Use of the word but here symbolises a kind of contradiction. Owen hopes for changes, but they never come. Our final stanza ends in the same way as the first stanza, suggesting that nothing has changed, despite the efforts and the death of many men, once again questioning if war is really worth it. Okay, so we're now just briefly going to touch on the structure and the form of the poem. Again, make sure you're listening carefully and adding to your annotations. So let's start with the basics. There are eight stanzas, all of the same length. As you go through the poem, there is very little sense of prog progression. The la last stanza ends with the same words as the first one, reflecting how the soldiers are waiting for something to happen, and it simply never does. For the most part, each stanza of the poem has a regular rhyme scheme, following an A, B, B, A, C rhyme scheme, although these are very often half rhymes, such as grow and grey, which stops this rhyme scheme from feeling satisfying or comforting for the reader. The rhymes are jagged and imperfect, like the reality of the men's experience. This could also reflect the confusion they are feeling and their fading energy due to war and the weather. The main thing that stands out structurally is that each stanza ends with a half line, leaving a gap which mirrors the monotony of life on the front line and the lack of hope and activity for the men. You're now going to have three key quotations from the poem to look at and analyse in depth, just as you have with all the other poems. I just wanted to take this opportunity to remind you that writing more is not always better. You're looking for quality, not quantity, 
So just before you write down the quotations and give analysis a go, just pause the video and remind yourself of the kinds of things you should be looking for and commenting on. Okay, so here's your first key quotation from the poem. It is the very first line of the poem, so obviously the mood of the poem is established here. What I would like you to do is to pause the video here for a few minutes and try to analyse the quotation in as much detail as you can. You can either do this electronically or write the quotation down. It's completely up to you. All right. Hopefully you now have some ideas of your own down, so let's talk through some of them together. The opening is abrupt, as if the poem is explaining what is happening in the midst of an experience. We get a sense of what is happening from the very first line of the poem, and even the first word. The use of the plural pronoun our demonstrates that this is a shared experience, creating a sense of togetherness. But this sense of togetherness is quickly followed by the word ache, which implies that this shared experience is painful. Through the first line, we also get a fair indication of what this poem will be about through the phrase, merciless iced east winds that nigh us, which shows nature being personified and attacking, set, setting nature up as a powerful force and also an enemy. This feeling is emphasised particularly through use of the adjective merciless, which is used to set up nature as an unforgiving adversary. The harsh weather conditions are an additional opponent for the soldiers. There are sibilant S sounds in iced east winds to convey the biting cold, the intensity of the wind that hurts them as if stabbed with a knife. The personification of the wind suggests that the weather is like a deliberately aggressive, violent, and inescapable enemy. The men are faced with double peril, enemy soldiers and the risk of hypothermia from exposure. To emphasise how long this drags on, ellipsis are used after silent. In this quotation, we get a very clear idea that man is not the enemy, which isn't what we would traditionally expect in war poetry. The predatory presence here is that of nature, and this is something that will very strongly run throughout the poem. The power of man is set up as weak and futile when put in opposition to nature. Right from the start, Owen wants us to see the soldiers in a position of weakness, immediately opposing heroic propagandist images, because he wanted to show the reality of war. This makes the reader feel sympathy for the soldiers as they are being attacked by an enemy which is far more powerful, making them seem hopeless. As I said earlier, the poem is written in the present tense using the first person plural, our, creating a sense of collective experience showing how the experience was shared by soldiers across the war. Here's our second quotation. Once again, pause the video for a minute, write down the quotation and start to write down your thoughts on language, themes, Owen's ideas and structure. All right, so let's start first with language again. The personification of the snow and cold emphasizes how the weather is as much of a threat as the enemy soldiers like a creature threatening the men physically. We can see this through pale flakes with fingering stealth come feeling for our faces. Snow appears or is typically seen as something that's soft, innocent, harmless. However, here the snow is very dangerous and it could lead to hypothermia. This, if we view it on a deeper level, could be linked to the concept of war and how, at first, war appears to be a good idea as it's fighting for your country and for your rights, but in reality it is treacherous and filled with murder and bloodshed. The alliterative F sounds reflect the softness of the snow. I know we've talked about that earlier when we were going through the poem. 
And obviously, that links to what we were talking about earlier, the snow we would generally associate with being soft, but here it's very dangerous. In the second line, the phrase forgotten dreams is a particularly tragic one. We must imagine that most of these men were very young and had never had a chance to realise their dreams. The implication here is that the soldiers can no longer bring themselves to dream as they have resigned themselves to death. The main theme we are presented with here is the power of nature, as nature is presented as a predator. The soldiers are shown to be powerless and ineffective. They may have been able to fight a human enemy, but they cannot fight against the unstoppable power of nature. In this quotation, Owen seeks to create further sympathy for the soldiers by making their situation seem hopeless, so much so that their dreams are now forgotten, just as Owen, who died at just 25 years old, would have felt hopeless and resigned to death himself. Each stanza of the poem does have a regular rhyme scheme. As we talked about earlier, it's that A, B, B, A, C rhyme scheme, reflecting the monotonous nature of war. But the rhymes are often half rhymes. It offers no sense of comfort or satisfaction because war in itself is not satisfying. This is our final key quotation. Again, just pause the video, write down your own thoughts, then come back. Okay, so Owen moves from the we and us of the soldier's point of view to the burying party and a third person narrator. They have died and the practical task of picking up and burying the bodies has to proceed. The reference to picks and shovels here is almost brutal. They are also burying the hopes and futures of the dead soldiers. Use of the word shaking here is significant, as shaking is a reaction to the cold, but is also an indication of grief. The idea that the faces of the fallen soldiers are half known suggests that they were disfigured to the point that they were hardly recognisable. Half known could also be ironic, as war propaganda depicted dying on the battlefield as somewhat honourable and heroic. Yet nobody really knows these heroes. Therefore, the supposed honour they died for was disingenuous. They died for nothing which demonstrates the futility of war. The striking phrase, all their eyes are ice, could refer to the dead soldiers, whose eyes may be literally frozen in the cold, or it could refer to the burying party, who are so used to death that its soldiers are numb. Their eyes are glazed and icy, too shocked to convey emotion. Finally, the final line of the poem takes us back to the beginning. The soldiers have achieved nothing. It is saying that war is pointless. The poem ends with a sombre tone. The soldiers are forced to succumb to the power of nature rather than the valorous deaths they had been promised by war propaganda. The final words, nothing happens, suggest that the pain of death and battle, which are consequences of war, doesn't change anything, and as such, questions the effectiveness of war. The reader feels the same anger as Owen, as we hear of the young men who have already forgotten their dreams, now losing their faces, their humanity, or their lives as a consequence of a seemingly ineffective and pointless war. This quotation, our final key quotation, exemplifies the lack of progression throughout the poem. The final stanza ends in the same way as the first stanza, reflecting the monotony of life in the trenches and the absence of change. The repetition of nothing happens emphasises that the pain that the soldiers endure during war is pointless as it brings no benefit to the ongoing conflict and typically ends in death. Okay, so by now you should have lots of annotations and a really solid understanding of the poem. What I would like you to do is to work through these questions and write down. How does exposure explore power? So who or what has the power here? 
How does exposure explore conflict? What kind of conflict are we dealing with? We know it isn't traditional man versus man combat, so what is it? Three ways in which the title exposure is relevant to the poem. Go back to the spider diagram you made at the start of this video tutorial and think about how any of the possible meanings of exposure could be applied to this poem. Remember, having alternative interpretations of language will get you important marks when writing a response. Two semantic fields found in the poem. Go back through the poem and see if you can find any words that you may group together. For example, a semantic field of conflict. And finally, one point about structure in the poem. Can you talk about the use of stanzas or rhythm and rhyme scheme? Anything to do with how Owen may have put this poem together to have a specific effect. So pause the video here and spend five to ten minutes writing down your answers. Use your notes and annotations to help guide you. So now that you've answered these questions, here are some suggested additional activities that can really extend your understanding about the poem and enable you to write more confidently about it. I suggest either producing an A4 research page about Wilfred Owen, where you research and discuss his life, his experience of war. Obviously, we know he was on the front line, but can you find out anything more than this? Can you find out some information about some of his other poems? I would suggest looking at Futility, Strange Meeting and Dolce et Decorum Est, but any of his poetry is fantastic really. And if you do that, can you look at some common themes that run throughout his poetry? This will really help you to confidently talk about his experience on the front line, but also his intentions when writing. Alternatively, you could produce a Venn diagram comparing and contrasting how exposure and one other poem that you've looked at so far present the power of nature. The poems may both present nature as powerful, but have they done this in exactly the same way? Probably not, so try to look for the subtle differences. Make sure you're finding key quotations from both poems and including these in your Venn diagram. Thanks so much for watching and listening. I hope you've enjoyed learning about Exposure by Wilfred Owen. It really is a fantastic poem. I hope you found this helpful. Goodbye.